Hi and welcome. Thank you so much for coming back and joining me in part two of this conversation. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Live, Stories Told, and right here is usually where I say, here's what I know, and go into a spiel on communication creating our social world and our role in that, but I've been thinking that it doesn't feel right to talk about what I know and to speak in definitives. I have more questions than I do answers anyway, so it'd be better if the language I use reflected that. So I'm thinking that maybe this space is less about me telling you about, you know, quote unquote, the way things are and more about us exploring together what meaning we want to make of things. And it's about us learning together. So instead of telling you what I think I know, here's my question for today. How can we keep leaning into questioning all that we think we know? There's so many different lenses to view our social worlds through and so many different meanings to be made. So I think it feels scary for a lot of people to always be questioning because it feels like there's no solid ground to stand on, right? But there's that saying, you know, that the only constant is change and that feels true for me. So instead of fighting change and growth, which is, as we're understanding, very natural for our human lives, I think our question becomes, how can we lean in? How can we give into that and make the most of those situations? I have this on my mind today because our conversation partner is Rebecca Tossig, and she has taught me things in this conversation and also in her book, which I highly recommend. And I've just been in a real learning posture, I guess is what you would call it, and I don't know, it's kind of humbling and also really exciting. So as I said, this is part two of our conversation with Rebecca Tossig. So make sure you go back and listen to part one, which is the power of seeing yourself represented in stories. And that link will be in the description. And then come back and join us for part two here. The only thing I want to say before jumping back into our conversation with Rebecca is to get ready to learn and to question today. Rebecca offers us some really helpful frameworks and makes some distinctions that can aid all of us in recognizing the importance of language, first of all, and then also the way that we conceptualize disability in our societies. Okay, okay, I don't want to give too much away, so let's just get into it. think that parents with disabilities in a lot of ways are just what I've started to see is that like we're really good managers of like um, figuring out who we need to support and when Um, and that just maybe looks different than the management that you do and when you take your car in to get its oil changed like it's just a different um, it's the same thing in different with different parts maybe or or something like that but um, Mm -hmm. it is interesting how much of that is taken for granted and assumed it's just like yeah and this is how it is Every single thing I encounter, I want to be saying, well, what does that mean? Or why Mm -hmm. does it mean that? You know, like just be asking those questions, be Mm -hmm. doing that reframing, be making those choices. Mm -hmm. What you're bringing me back to is that one of my, I would say one of the most like paradigm shifting concepts in your book is the idea that everything is already an accommodation. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) why are we so hard pressed to add a couple more? to our especially maybe like our physical world Mm -hmm. that would help people who move around the world differently Mm -hmm. than people who move on to functioning legs Mm -hmm. that includes them and that I think is just so important and fits into that same paradigm of like what do we consider good independence or what do we you know rely on of like yeah somebody said stairs work for Mm -hmm. a lot of these people let's make stairs or yeah just like Mm -hmm. the way that a car is designed Mm -hmm. it's all an accommodation to some human bodies Mm -hmm. some kind of imagined notion of an average body right exactly and so what why not just keep accommodating and accommodating and accommodating Mm -hmm. you know it's like it doesn't put anybody out to like be more accommodating to people I don't know I just think that such an important realization yeah. to have of yeah. to see it's not it's not oh my body is normal and I don't need accommodations and that person does mm-hmm. it's I just happen to have this body that's already 
it is built into society yes. to accommodate me. Yes, yes. And we don't think about those as accommodations. We don't think about like yeah. cups and clothes and doorknobs and I, I've never as, thought about yeah. it like that until you said it. And now I keep thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. And you're like, actually, this has already been built by someone and someone made design yeah. choices thinking about a certain kind of hand or, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, essentially that that gets at the idea of universal design and that like, yeah, when we design like we have this notion of what an average body is, but when we design for bodies that are on the edges of whatever average is, mm -hmm. then we create these spaces and, um, and, and classrooms and, um, and curriculum and that, that, is, that works for more of us or hopefully yeah. all of us. <laughs> it's a, a lot that we take for granted for sure. Yeah. Again, I want to bring up my favorite phrase from your book that you used was collaborative reimagination. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, you know, in the spirit of CMM, what does that mean mm -hmm. to you? But I also want to point out that like, th that the conversation we are already having is already about collaborative mm -hmm. reimagination. Mm -hmm. And I specifically, I just, I know I can get into the weeds here because you also are a lover of words. The reimagination mm -hmm. points to what I was just saying about a choice. This was already mm -hmm. imagined mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when someone said, we value independence, we value, this yeah. is the way our society is set up. This is the way we function, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. That was one imagination mm -hmm. of the way things could be. Let's reimagine mm -hmm. the way things could be. The layer on top of that being in a collaborative way yeah. with all of these other voices that were not at that original imagination exactly. table. Yeah. That could be a part of it now. Once you see it and say it, it's it feels strange that there was a time when you didn't see it or say it. Like the idea that like mm -hmm. this was imagined, this was created, this people yeah. sat at a table, you know, like people made mm -hmm. decisions and that can change like that. I don't mm -hmm. even know how old I was when that I realized like, oh, this could be different. We could do this yeah. differently, actually. It's not just like gravity, like it has to work only in one yeah, way. Yeah. Sometimes it can feel that way or people seem to propose that that's the case, but it's not. Um, mm -hmm. So collaborative reimagining, I mean, I think the collaborative piece of it to me feels so important because there's so many different experiences, embodiments, people living here, and so many people who have not been involved in the shaping of, of how all of yeah. this looks. And so it, it feels like, how would we possibly know how to build something that works for all of us if we're not listening to all of us, if we don't all have a voice to speak into this? And I think about that a lot, even just with like, I, since my book came out, I get invited to speak at places. And a lot of people have questions for me about how to make things more accessible or inclusive in a workspace. And I, I feel like it feels strange to me because I feel like, well, I, I mean, like, I'm glad that you're asking me. I'm one voice. I, I, I can only speak yeah. to one part of this, especially if we're having a conversation about like disability and access. Like mm -hmm. I have a visible physical disability that I've had since childhood. There is so much that fits under the umbrella yeah. of disability and, and, and that can, the needs and supports required in those experiences are really different. And so it feels like we need each, all of these voices mm -hmm. to build something. And then, yes, like we, like you mentioned, like the reimagining part, I think to me, imagination became such a big word as I was working on that book, because it felt like over and over and over again, like typically disability is framed as like this problem to solve or overcome. Yeah. And to me, as I like dug into my stories and, and the things I wanted to say in that book, it felt like so much like to me, disability is like this prompt for imagination. Like when you look to disability and the experience of people with disabilities, you are prompted to imagine something different that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise, that you wouldn't mm -hmm. have, you know? Yeah. Even like this, the tools that we have, like closed captioning was made for people yep. who are deaf and hard of hearing. There was a prompt there that this could be a tool and there was not easy like there was a lot of resistance yeah. to that right yeah. and then um and then once you lean into that and you see what comes of leaning into deafness or being hard of hearing and this thing pops up that didn't exist before right and then mm -hmm. that becomes this tool that like now everybody is reliant on yeah if they have a phone or or, or like watching a game at the bar so so yes collaborative and that all of these voices are invaluable not just like it would be nice but like this is 
important and fundamental to building is having all of these voices and then the re the imagination and reimagination part of it being like we could do this differently what what else could be sparked by listening to all of the voices at the table so yeah imagination feels like something that i think in a lot of ways i feel like culturally we're really starved for being able to picture different ways of doing this and yeah and i think that i think that that folks with disabilities have so much to offer in that space. Absolutely. Just while we're kind of talking about, you know, this kind of language and what it means to us, I just kind of popped in my head the other day as I was thinking about our conversation is that a couple of years ago, I'm just curious, like how you feel about this language is that um, someone that I worked with, I heard them use the phrase or the word um, disabled, as in differently abled yeah. instead of disabled. And I remember thinking like, Oh, I hear where she's coming from, but I was like, I wonder how you feel about that language or what that language or that distinction means to you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is such a good question. And I feel like we could do a whole podcast on language. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Um, um, I mean, like where to start. I think part of it that is interesting with words like disabled, I've never heard it that way, but, or like I heard differently abled or things like that is that it, it, I mean, there's layers to unpack there because I do appreciate the attempt of like. I think that the the purpose of that is an attempt at creating some kind of equality or like not stigmatizing yeah. one kind of ability over another. Yeah. But I think part of what irks a lot of folks with disabilities or people who grew up disabled is that that feels like a euphemism, which means that mm-hmm. it feels like somehow if you acknowledge that I have a disability that that's bad. And so we need to come up yeah. with words to, mm. to distance ourselves from that. The word dis I mean, like it's, it's also interesting to me that when we talk about language, it's so, it can be so personal to people on an individual yeah. level. Like a word can like feel like a punch in the gut or it can feel like yeah. um, an invitation of warmth and, you know, like it can feel so personal. And when you think about the experience of disability being so personal, there are people that have very strong, strong, strong feelings about the words that we choose yeah. um, and for different reasons. Um, and so like the word disability or, or being saying that I'm disabled for a lot of people, I think mostly people older than me, uh, but for a lot of people that feels like an insult. And so we want to mm. reach for a different word in order to like, avoid insulting someone. But I think for a lot of people of, of my generation, I think that there has been and younger is that there has been sort of this em, embrace of an experience as an identity yeah. and a culture. And so there's pride in the saying I'm disabled. It's a part of me. It's a part, it's built into my body. So it's a part of my yeah. stories and, and there's pride in that. And I think and part of why the word disabled is latched onto maybe is that there's a lot of momentum behind that word anyways like that word is built mm-hmm. into legislation and so it's not really yeah. going anywhere and so i think that <laughs> right. right like and i think that like reaching for that word in particular might be because it is already established in some way and so there's reclaiming of identity in a word that is not going anywhere but like like language like special needs is interesting too because there is a lot of momentum behind a word like special needs it's built into the education system right but a lot of people in a way that is like, if we're thinking about the word disability or being disabled, I think when we say different, disabled or differently abled, part of what's missing in that language, besides the fact that it feels like a euphemism, Mm -hmm. is it doesn't necessarily acknowledge that socially or in the built environment that we're disabled by something like the world is not built for the abilities that I have. And so being disabled in some ways means I've been disabled by society or I've been disabled by built environments or, you know, like there's something signaling that this is this is this is different and it's not because I'm less valuable or because I yeah my abilities are less than yours but that the environment is different for me the history the culture yeah is different for someone with a disability and so I think that's part of that reclaiming as well but with a term like special needs that does have momentum that is built into into our Uh systems in some meaningful way um, I think part of what people really get frustrated with, with a term like special needs is that it does directly tell a story about needs and that only some of them are special. I mean, like to go back mm. to what we were already saying about accommodations, yeah. we all need accommodations. It's just that some of us have them and some of us don't. Um, yes. And so special needs makes it seem like my needs themselves are somehow exceptional when really all of the students in this school have needs and these needs are just um, not being met based on the structures that already exist. And so people get 
really frustrated often, like especially people in the education systems, people get frustrated by critiques of that word and, and that language. And they ask like, what else could we, like, what are the other things we could possibly say? And I think a lot of people say like, just being more specific about what that accommodation or that need is for that student, like being able to have more specific language that describes what's happening and what supports are required than just like this blanket special needs term. But I don't know mm -hmm. that that's going anywhere, but there are a lot of people right. that push against it and feel frustrated by that kind of language and the implications of it. But yeah, I mean, like there are people who have like own the word cripple, like they feel pride in saying yeah. cripple or crip. But then like a word like handicap is sort of, it's not used in most spaces anymore because the mm -hmm. people who are trying to get the language right would say that's not the correct term anymore. And the people who are reclaiming terms with pride are picking it up. So, you know, like uh -huh. it's interesting how these words sort of morph and how the right one changes. <laughs> I think within the disability community itself, the big tension or the big kind of debate is over person first language or identity first language. Yeah. And I, I think what um, makes the most sense these days is to, to um, defer to however people want to be described themselves mm -hmm. um, and, and acknowledge that there's, there's that that language and however people, whatever terms people choose is, is a personal yeah. choice and it feels significant like in that person's body how they're described and they should have the right to choose um mm -hmm. which way they prefer but also just recognizing sort of the implications of both and what the story that each is telling seems yeah. important that there's different ways to think about that and and they can both make sense reiterate what you said at the beginning it's I'm not hearing everything you just said and say yep that's that on that this mm -hmm. is how people with disabilities feel right. about these words it's that's what Rebecca feels about mm -hmm. these words and yeah. that again a pluralistic truth that yeah. can be true and at the same time someone could feel entirely differently but I think it is you know what we're almost getting into with disability is the difference between like the literal definition and then the connotations that we hear mm -hmm. around it mm -hmm. because I can again understand maybe some kind of like altruistic purpose behind someone saying that someone is disabled, mm -hmm. differently abled instead of disabled mm -hmm. as an attempt to try to highlight the fact that the abilities that the person have are different mm -hmm. rather than bad or undesirable, which maybe disabled feels mm -hmm. like those are the connotations of that because it's maybe historically seen as like a negative mm -hmm. descriptor. Mm -hmm. But like you're getting at disabled is almost like a if you've described yourself or understood yourself to be disabled your whole life mm -hmm. in maybe a neutral kind of way mm -hmm. of just like, this is just something I am or something I have, then disabled is almost like a, yeah, you should feel bad about that. Yeah. Yeah. Where it doesn't have to be like, you're saying it can be a reclaiming. And I especially love the distinction of, I know there's, you know, some language you said like person first, mm -hmm. I know that would maybe be like, um, someone saying like, uh, you are a disabled person yeah. or you are a person with a disability. And so there's that distinction between like, mm -hmm. I am or I have, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's an important distinction. But then also the layer that you just added for me is that it's almost like if you said Rebecca is disabled, mm -hmm. I want to hear that as Rebecca is disabled by society. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it's putting the focus and again, the like problem to be fixed, mm -hmm. not as Rebecca is mm -hmm. the problem to be mm -hmm. fixed, but the society that Rebecca exists in yeah. is the problem to be fixed. You're, it's not that, yeah, I appreciated the way you said that, which was, you are disabled by yes. the society that you live in. Yes, exactly. That is the context that makes that so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I don't know that people often think of it that way, but that is how I think about it. I have it. never yeah. thought of it that way. And that's super helpful <laughs> yeah. though. Yeah. That like, I've already put all in on, you know, what you wrote about in your book and what we've already been talking about, that it's like, it's not the person with the disability that necessarily needs to be mm -hmm. fixed. They mm -hmm. are not the problem to be solved. It's outside of them. It's the society that's the problem mm -hmm. to be solved. But mm -hmm. even just having that exact phrasing feels really important yeah. to me. I don't know if other people care about the language as much <laughs> as I do, but like in the weeds of that is like yeah. my favorite. I love that. Yeah. Well, I mean, like language is so interesting in that, like it, it feels like it's everything and it feels like it's insufficient. I mean, to me as a writer, yeah. I feel like I'm constantly searching for the exact right words and like, what is the story that feels the truest and makes the most sense? And yep. what words can I arrange to make that happen? And then always feels like it's like, like 
it escapes me somehow still, even with all of the words and even with the language. And so I think like to me in conversations about disability, there are often conversations about what words should we be using and what are the right words. And to me, I just, in a lot of ways, I feel curious about what are the conversations we're having about words Um, and and being curious about that and and open to listening to how people are thinking about that and and still holding Mm -hmm. on to what makes the most sense to me but maybe yeah. being open to changing that or, you know, like, I, I just think that language changes with time. Um, and yes. so just like being curious about that and listening to the people who, who are being described, I think is essential in, in any time that we're choosing words, if we're describing it yeah. to people as yeah. what, do you, what makes the most sense to you and what are these people saying about how they want to be described? Yeah. And again, it's not what is quote unquote right, but what feels right to that person, which could feel different to another person. I just think the language is so important because it's like, if you don't have the language to describe what you're experiencing, then you don't describe what you're experiencing. You don't get to talk about it. And, you know, there's different ways that language emerges, but yeah, I just think that having, having any language, whatever language you choose is so empowering. Yes. Yes. Like, no, yes. I think that's like even having options to choose at all. It's like, no, yeah. Yeah, Right. Yeah. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. I think even, I think it's wild how like having access to a word can unlock something in your brain and make you see Mm -hmm. like the word ableism, like knowing the word ableism. That is one word, but like knowing it and knowing what it means, it's like you're able to see, you have, we literally have a different lens to see the world through. Yes. Um, and that is wild how powerful that can so be. So powerful. Yes. I love the language. I could just live in the language forever, <laughs> considering it, thinking about yeah. it, using it. But I also know that beyond this, like maybe, I don't know, awareness building phase, Mm -hmm. which is, I think when you get language that there's another necessary step beyond that, which is then like the taking action. Like, what do you do with this new awareness that you have? And again, that's part of my theory, not my theory, but the theory I Uh use for this podcast is that kind of the central claim of the theory is that we are persons in conversation, Mm -hmm. which is this, but you know, just Mm -hmm. by nature of living and being a human being in a community, we're a person in Mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. Persons in conversation co-create their social worlds. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is that, and we're also shaped by those social worlds. Mm -hmm. And so it's a shaping and being shaped to shaping and being shaped. Yes, yes, yes. And that feels like a helpful lens to understand, like, the way that you describe your story is that here's kind of these initial ways that I was shaped. And then here's how I shaped my own world back. Mm -hmm. And here's how the other stories that I heard shaped me. And then I started using this language or I understood myself in this new way. And it's just a shaping and shaping and shaping. So it is like beautiful to like you were getting at before realize that you have some power to create a new meaning in the world and then also recognizing that the meaning that already exists or the meaning that other people are working on making for themselves shapes you yeah I would love to talk about my favorite chapter in your book was when you talked about your first experience of teaching a high school English class your favorite chapter oh god that was my favorite (laughs) because I saw myself a lot in it because I feel like I my hope with the podcast is that I'm kind of straddling like the world of academia and then like outside of academia, yeah. not non-academics yeah. and like, okay, all these theories mm-hmm. that exist in the world of like communication mm-hmm. are so great. I was sitting in those classes feeling so empowered mm-hmm. by this knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, what good are these doing sitting in a mm-hmm. textbook? Mm-hmm. The real people in the real social worlds, in the real relationships, doing the real communicating yes. should have these tools in a tangible way. Mm-hmm. Accessible, so that, yes. Mm-hmm. Accessible, mm-hmm. yeah. So that we can be making these better social worlds that these theorists say are the goal. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And I just, I resonated with your experience of, I have all this passion. Yeah. I want to bring it to people. And then I feel like I'm met with blank stares sometimes. Uh, so yeah. I won't say it. You know, it was a painful chapter, yes. uh, you know, acknowledge that because I feel the like passion that you had, but I, yeah. could you talk about that experience a little yeah. bit and maybe even like to keep going into how we are considering disability, could you explain the difference between the medical model yes. and the social yes, model? Yes, 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 I'm yes, sure yes. that's really an in-depth conversation. Again, that could be its own podcast, yes. but well, we, whatever yeah. you think. It's so interesting to hear you say that it was your favorite chapter. I don't think I've ever heard <laughs> anyone say that that was their favorite. And I, um, it was not my favorite chapter to write. So I love I believe that. 
I love knowing that it was worth it. Yeah. Because, it was <laughs> Abby. And, and if not favorite, it was a very meaningful yeah, chapter is yeah, what I'll say. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, there's a lot there, right? There's a lot yeah. into that chapter. So I, yeah, I, after I graduated, like I finished, we talked a little bit earlier about like finding this theory in graduate school and mm -hmm. having my world transformed through it. And it felt like maybe similarly to you, it felt like if people just know these things, like the yeah. only problem is that they just don't know them. And so if I can tell them, then that's how we like fix this, you know, the whole problem of discrimination of, of disability. Like we'll just start in the classrooms and I'll just tell them. And I was really hopeful and idealistic. And there were a number of layers to what made that hard. I didn't go into the book about, I got a job teaching at a very small independent high school, mm -hmm. like a very rigorous, everyone is going to go to Ivy leagues kind of school. Um, yeah. And so I was very excited because I was going to like get to challenge these already like actively minded, like ready for a challenge, intellectual challenge right. kind of thing. I was the new teacher at this school. And part of the dynamic that I don't really go into in the book is that like, they had thought they were going to have a different teacher that semester. So it was like the seniors, mm. the seniors of the school, uh, yeah. they were like, we made it this far. We kind of, we, we know the drill way more than you do. And we were expecting yeah. this other teacher. And then suddenly we're thrown into like disability literature. Like what they had, you know, so there was already yeah. that has just like, wasn't what they were expecting. Right. And so um, there was that hurdle and I was the new teacher and there was that hurdle. And I dove head first into teaching this course with very little awareness of like how personally I would feel everything. And so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. often when we're teaching, there's at least some kind of distance between like the text and, yeah. and it was like, I mean, like at a certain point in the semester as sort of like this desperate attempt to make things feel personal and real to them, I even like shared my Instagram account with them. So I was like, it was like, could not be more personal what I was yeah, teaching right. them. And you know, it's interesting. Anyone who works with people understand the phenomenon of like, when you have 20 people in front of you and two of them don't like, don't connect with what you're saying, it's so easy to focus on the two, those two. Yeah, yeah. And so they were just like a handful of kids. Um, one class in particular was a little bit harder of, of students that were really resistant to anything I was trying to mm. share with them. And, and so maybe this is a good point to segue into what some of what I was trying to teach them. And one of the things we talked about at the very front end of the semester was these different models of disability, which is essentially different lenses for how we can look at disability in the world around us. Mm -hmm. And the like, two really prominent frameworks would be the medical model and the social model. And the medical model is really the default model that we have tended to look at disability. We've looked at disability through that lens mm -hmm. for a really long time. Another word for it is the individual model. Um, so which I kind of prefer. The medical model suggests that all of these things take place in hospitals and with doctors and that's right. not the case. Um, so mm -hmm. it's really kind of the, the, the crux of the difference between these models is where you locate the problem. Do we locate the problem within the individual disabled body and mind or do we locate the problem in the context and environment and, and society surrounding that? Yeah, disability. And so the illustration that I gave them was just like this cartoon of a woman sitting in a wheelchair at the bottom of a flight of stairs. And do we look at that situation and say that woman um, would be better off if she was if we could fix her disability and she could walk and she probably should just go somewhere else because this place isn't suitable for her or do we look at the building and say like there are other ways we could design this and how silly that we hadn't thought that we should have you know, multiple points of entry. That's kind of the major shift. And that's the like, really like basic big blocks example. Sure. Um, but it's also, I mean, like, interestingly enough, I didn't ha I hadn't read Judy Human's memoir when I taught that class because mm -hmm. it hadn't been written yet, but Judy Human has a um, uh, disability activist, Judy Human. Are you yep. familiar with Judy Human? I follow her on Instagram. Okay. I know she just passed away. She did in March. Right. She just passed I followed away. her on Instagram when I followed a bunch of other people okay. based on the resources that you have at the back of yeah, your book. She, so okay, you cool. led me to her. Oh, great. Oh, that's cool. Well, she, um, she is a huge part of disability history and activism. Mm -hmm. and it's a huge reason why things have changed in legislation the way that it has, but mm. she, in her memoir, she's kind of talking about what the world was like when she was growing up. And, um, when she went to college, the, she, it was like a completely inaccessible college campus. And she, like in her dorm, 
the only bathroom she could access was up a flight of stairs. And so every time she wanted to go to the bathroom, she uh-huh. would have to recruit someone to carry her up those stairs. Like every time. So you think oh about the mental toll of that and like yeah. how that would shape your relationships. And that's just yeah. one example of what things were like on that campus. Yeah. Talk but, about dependence. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and how that would shape your experience so profoundly. And so yeah. the president at the school where she attended was quoted in the school newspaper as saying that he believed that disabled students should not attend this university because it would be psychologically traumatic for them. So mm-hmm. like, if you think about the lenses there, right? Like yeah. is the problem these kids trying to attend this school or is the yeah. problem this campus that would be psychologically traumatic yeah. for some of the <laughs> students, right? Like for mm-hmm. students that want to attend. And so that was the beginning of the conversation with these students. And, and several of them just had a very difficult time understanding disability as anything other than like a biological defect, like a, Mm. like a, something is broken in this prototype of a human. And this is like, like, um, almost like a a toaster that is broken or something, right? Like what else is it other than a broken toaster? Um, so there was a lot of that. There was, um, there, there were students who, um, like just could not, how would I describe this? Like I had them write these journals over the course of the semester. I called them metacognitive journals and that they were like thinking about their thinking as we went through this yep. course, um, which was maybe something I shouldn't have read. I like, I don't know if I should have read that because maybe I didn't need to know those things. Um, but um, a lot of them, the way that they would talk about their own thoughts on disability was, was full of a lot of, um, um, like pity and condescension is how I would yeah. interpret it. But, mm-hmm. but um, I think there was a, it was difficult for them to see that as anything other than positive because they felt like they were being compassionate and, mm-hmm. em- and empathetic. And, and so there were like parts of it that were sticky and it was like, yeah. And, and, and so at like at one point in the semester, we watched the film, Me Before You. Are you familiar with this one? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. Just for anyone listening who isn't, it's a, pretty much resounding response from the disability community is a bit of horror uh, based on a book. And it's supposed to be a love story about a man who's injured in an accident and becomes a quadriplegic. And he ends up falling in love with a woman who's been hired to be a care worker for him. And in the end of the movie, almost like in term, almost it's framed almost as this act of love to protect her from having to care for him. He ends his life. So I, we watched that movie and in my mind, the critique of that was so obvious and clear that I didn't, I don't even remember how I set it up, but I was just expecting us to sort of examine the ways that this narrative, not only, I mean, like how it was harmful, how it didn't even accurately represent disability in a lot of real ways, like, like scene by scene, like the scenes that they put together were kind of absurd to me. Uh And the response from the students was like, Oh, what a beautiful love. You know, like, so all semester long, I'm kind of having all of these moments where I feel like I'm just like banging my head against the wall and it's surreal and it's confusing. Yeah. I, I mean, like the, probably the lowest point in the semester was when one of the kids came into my office and, uh, and told me that he, he couldn't connect with anything that we were reading or talking about that semester like he did not care and i i don't even think he was trying i don't th- he was earnest about it he was like yeah. like help me solve this problem i don't care um mm-hmm. and so um you know that was part of the experience um I, i'd like listened to these kids discuss things that felt theoretical to them but very personal to me yeah. um so thinking about like well wouldn't the world be better if disability didn't exist and i'm there's no way that i'm me the only visibly disabled person in that room is not mm-hmm. taking a lot of that on into my body and yeah. feeling a lot yeah. of things and so it ended up that we made it through the semester thank god it was only a semester long course and not a yeah. year it was, it was, <laughs> and, and i want to be clear like as i was writing about that Um, again, I feel protective of those students in that, like, I realize it's easy to point to them and be like, oh, they don't get it. And they're how awful that they don't get it. And I, Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I think that like the reality was so much messier than that. The reality was like 18 year olds, 17 and 18 year olds with a certain kind of life experience, trying on new ideas for the first time in front of their visibly disabled teacher, like the setup of that. And for me, 
I hope that it's clear. It was painful to write, but like, I did not do a great job of teaching them that semester. Like I was a mess. I was overwhelmed. I was like, my feelings were hurt. Like I, that was not a good setup for any of us. And so I hope that's clear in the chapter that it's not just like this awesome teacher went to this school where all the kids refused to learn. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Um, but it was painful and it was messy and it was really hard. And there was a lot of resistance, even as there was also a lot of growth. Um, and I mm-hmm. think there were a lot of kids that did learn a lot that semester. The next the semester, both and. yeah, exactly. I'm so glad we're on that same page about the both and. It was very much yeah. the both and. And the next semester, I made a lot of changes that I that felt good. I um, I opened up what we were looking at to to look at all different kinds of embodiments, not just specifically disability. Yeah. Um, they, the kids themselves that semester really found personal connections to the material, which I think mm. was really missing in the first semester. Like they were able to connect. A lot of students in that class had ADHD. And so there were interesting conversations about that as a diagnosis and an experience. Um, and so it, I slowly, like, I felt like I learned a little bit more how to approach that conversation in a way that protected me and allowed them more opportunities to connect. Um, But, oh gosh, it was, it was awful. It was so rough. It was so rough. And I'm, I'm honestly, I am glad for the experience. I think I saw and learned a lot, but it was very painful and not fun to write about. So I'm glad you got things out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I don't, when I say it's my favorite, I don't want to be like, God, I loved watching you struggle. <laughs> but oh, what I mean is that I think that the stories that we most want to hear are the messy ones. Yeah. And the stories that we most need to hear yeah. are the messy ones. The stories we most need to hear from other people and <sighs> coincidentally are the hardest to tell yeah. for ourselves. And you see that, you know, that's only just exacerbated by social media mm-hmm. where it's like, Tell the pretty stories, tell the clean stories yeah. that make you look really good. It, the platform doesn't lend itself as naturally. It, it's not that you can't tell those stories, but it just doesn't maybe come as naturally to tell the, I don't know, messier yeah. stories, the times when you fail, the times when you learned, you know, the times when you made yeah. mistakes and you could now look back and say, oh, I learned a lot at that yeah. time. But I just think those stories are so important to share. And that's part of some of those stories are our untold stories yeah. because- we've been told that we should feel shame about Mm -hmm. them or that we should Mm -hmm. feel embarrassed or that there's no space here Mm -hmm. for those kinds of stories. We don't want those stories. Yeah. We don't want those stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Cause it adds maybe some complexity to our own understanding of ourselves. So we're like, well, I don't know how to handle that. And so I say it's my favorite to say that those are, those are my favorite kind of stories Mm -hmm. in general of the ones where people could say that they've learned something in that especially because I think you told it so well and that, you you know, it it came across to me reading it of that both and of Mm -hmm. like, here's my struggle in this and Mm -hmm. here's the student's struggle in this and here's where we missed each other. Mm -hmm. And this is not a shame story. Good. It was, it's just a story. Good. I'm glad that you, one of the many. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm glad that that came through because that felt important to me that I don't want to villainize anyone really. Okay, that is all for part two of our conversation with Rebecca, but you can join us next week for part three. Part three is just a short wrap-up episode to this whole conversation, so you definitely won't want to miss it. As a reflection, I want to offer you the question, what did you learn in this conversation today? Maybe there's something you thought you knew about disability or about yourself, and now maybe it could be worth doing some rethinking about disability or about yourself. I encourage you to try on some of these new frameworks that we talked about today. As always, this podcast is brought to you by the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. This podcast is just one of the really amazing initiatives that the CMM Institute has created in order to be seeking ways to make those better social worlds and to get all of us in on that process as well. And of course, as far as next turns for the podcast go, please share this episode with someone who you think would find it meaningful. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious and thank you for being a part of this story. I'm Abby and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. Mm